go ahead and turn in your Bibles to Daniel, Daniel chapter 4. Just a note for your thinking in your mind this morning. Uh, Scott read to us Job chapter 9, gave some pertinent thought. Job's mindset was one of question, struggle, and real serious difficulty. We answered Job with the singing of the hymn, Whate'er my God ordains is right. We also heard one of the great answers in preaching from Paul in Acts 17, a recognition of who God is and ultimately who he sent, the Son, his one and only Son that he resurrected from the dead. These things are not simply about our minds and us being able to think of them on our own, And so we sung a hymn asking that the Lord meet with his people in illumination through the power of the Spirit. Come and meet with this congregation. And now we come to a time that the word of God will coincide with those thoughts and we will see it in the context and the life and the end of the life of Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel 4. Let's read together the very end of of this chapter, continuing from where we left off a few weeks ago, Daniel 4, verse 28. You remember that Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. No one could interpret it. He called Daniel in. Daniel interpreted the dream to him. The dream was an interpretation, in a sense, against him and toward him and his life and his ending. And verse 28 starts this way. All this happened to Nebuchadnezzar the king. Twelve months later, he was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon. The king reflected and said, Is this not Babylon the great, which I myself have built as a royal residence by the might of my power and for the glory of my majesty? While the word was in the king's mouth, a voice came from heaven saying, King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is declared, sovereignty has been removed from you, and you will be driven away from mankind, and your dwelling place will be with the beasts of the field. You will be given grass to eat like cattle, and seven periods of time will pass over you until you recognize that the Most High is ruler over the realm of mankind and bestows it on whomever he wishes. Immediately the word concerning Nebuchadnezzar was fulfilled, and he was driven away from mankind and began eating grass like cattle, and his body was drenched with the dew of heaven until his hair had grown like eagles' feathers and his nails like birds' claws. But at the end of that period... I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes toward heaven, and my reason returned to me, and I blessed the Most High and praised and honored him who lives forever. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing, but he does according to his will in the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of earth. And no one can ward off his hand or say to him, what have you done? At that time, my reason returned to me and my majesty and splendor were restored to me for the glory of my kingdom and my counselors and my nobles began seeking me out. So I was reestablished in my sovereignty and surpassing greatness was added to me. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise, exalt and honor the king of heaven For all his works are true, and his ways just, and he is able to humble those who walk in pride. We began this section 
with seeing Nebuchadnezzar walking out on the palace roof looking at Babylon the Great. One writer noted, Nebuchadnezzar referred to the city as the Great Babylon, and indeed it was great. Babylon was one of the preeminent cities of history, and during Nebuchadnezzar's reign, undoubtedly was the most magnificent city on earth. Herodotus, the ancient Greek historian, visited Babylon about 100 years after Nebuchadnezzar's time and was overwhelmed by its grandeur. Over 200 years later, Alexander the Great planned to make the city the headquarters of his vast empire. Babylon was a rectangularly shaped city, according to one writer, surrounded by a broad and deep water-filled moat and then by an intricate system of double walls. The first double wall system encompassed the main city. Its inner wall was 21 feet thick and reinforced with defense towers at 60-foot intervals while the outer wall was 11 feet in width and also had watchtowers. It had eight gates providing access to the city. And it had at least three palaces, one of which was the principal palace in the southern citadel and covering about 350 by 200 yards. And this palace included a beautifully decorated throne room. Now that throne room will be seen in chapter 5. And writer says, Babylon also boasted the famous hanging gardens, which the ancient Greeks considered one of the seven wonders of the world. According to the Babylonian historian Berosus, Nebuchadnezzar constructed these for his wife, who had left the mountains of the native media for the alluvial plains of Babylonia. Her husband, in effect, built a mountain in the city to remind his wife of her homeland. Quote, These were elevated gardens, high enough to be seen beyond the city walls. They boasted many different kinds of plants and palm trees. Ingenious hoists had been contrived by which to raise water to the high terraces from the Euphrates River. So from the roof of his palace, the king gazed out upon all this grandeur and his heart became filled with pride. Now before we condemn Nebuchadnezzar too quickly, think about it for a moment. If you were the king who was the one who had commanded, demanded, and instructed that all of this be built, and it was built at your command by all of those who you put under your command, and you looked out over it, not many human hearts would go without swelling with pride over what they saw. With Daniel and Isaiah, Isaiah having some and various connections, it reminded me of Isaiah 42.8. I am the Lord. The covenant Lord said through Isaiah, that is my name. I will not give my glory to another, nor my praise to graven images. Nebuchadnezzar had broken multiple commandments in his lifetime. But here at this point, he had come so far as to break the greatest commandment. He had put himself above God. And he was worshiping himself through all that he had made. 
And so we see in chapter 4. The great reflection of not only the dream and its interpretation, but the final reasoning for the purpose of the prophecy and the retribution that God brings on Nebuchadnezzar. God here chastens him in the greatest of ways. Besides death itself. I want us to see three main thoughts this morning. Number one, Nebuchadnezzar lost his stable kingdom. Nebuchadnezzar lost his stable kingdom. Number two, Nebuchadnezzar lost his stable mind. Nebuchadnezzar lost his stable mind. And number three, Nebuchadnezzar lost his stable sovereignty. He lost his stable sovereignty. He lost his stable kingdom. He lost his stable mind. He lost his stable sovereignty. Let's consider, number one, Nebuchadnezzar lost his stable kingdom. Firstly, under that heading, he surmised it was coming. He surmised it was coming. If we consider his recollection of the dream and the sense of the dream, in verse 17 of chapter 4, Nebuchadnezzar says, This sentence is by the decree of the angelic watchers and the decision is a command of the holy ones in order that the living may know that the Most High is ruler over the realm of mankind and bestows on it whom he wishes and sets over it the lowliest of men. Now this is before any recognition at the end of the chapter. Here he is in the midst of the dream and in a sense the terror or the uncomfortableness of the dream and he in some sense surmises what is coming it's before even Daniel gives the interpretation but we also see in verses 22 to 27 he forgot it was coming The prophecy had been foretold in verses 22 to 27. But he forgot it was coming. This prophecy was forgotten and by the time we get to verse 29, it's just a recognition in 28 that all this happened. But 29 is saying 12 months later he was walking on the roof of the palace. Now think about it. If verse 17... And then the verses 22 to 27 are really weighing on your mind, really, really heavy. When you go to walk on the palace roof and look at everything, and it's really heavy, the interpretation of the dream, that you're coming to an end. Would you really be standing there glorifying yourself? No. No. He forgot it was coming. He had put it on the back burner. He had put it in the the back part of his mind. He had filed it somewhere away. But then thirdly, he heard the voice declare it's coming. He heard the voice declare it's coming. In verse 31, after he had seen all of these things, surmised his great glory, the word says, King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is declared, sovereignty has been removed from you. 
And this is the point at which the very unfolding of the prophecy takes place. And the first thing he lost was his stable kingdom. His sovereignty was removed. His sovereignty over the kingdom itself. Well, this brings us to the second point. Nebuchadnezzar lost his stable mind. Nebuchadnezzar lost his stable mind. We see the unfolding of him losing his sovereignty. But in verse 32, the prophecy has come into action. And you will be driven away from mankind and your dwelling place will be with the beasts of the field. You will be given grass to eat like cattle. And this will be for seven periods of time. Now, I want to say just a word about that phrase, seven periods of time. It's been very hard to know exactly what is meant by the phrase. But what I do want you to note here, that whether this is seven periods of time dealing with a day, a week, a month, or years, the proper interpretation of that in whatever periods those, that time frame is in is in the context of dealing with Nebuchadnezzar in his life at that time and over this period of time it will happen to you that this prophecy is fulfilled. There's no reason to take the seven periods of time and make it something futuristic. It's dealing specifically with Nebuchadnezzar and what will take place in his life at that moment in time. Whatever the periods of time may be. And we know that to be the case because it's saying this will happen to you in this time frame until the end. And we see in this chapter beginning in verse 34 the end of the time period, however long it may be. So what takes place in this time period? Nebuchadnezzar lost his stable mind. Nahum 1-2 says, A jealous and avenging God is the Lord. The Lord is avenging and wrathful. The Lord takes vengeance on his adversaries, and he reserves wrath for his enemies. Nebuchadnezzar was an enemy of God, and God was bringing wrath upon him. He was an enemy of God, and all that had been revealed to him, he continued to walk away from it. From the very start of of just the activity of Daniel in his life. He continues to walk away from that which is told to him. Now you remember, Daniel is serving as a prophet in the context. He's interpreting these dreams to Nebuchadnezzar. In essence... The word of God is being presented to Nebuchadnezzar time and time again. And time and time again, he is walking away. So God is bringing wrath on him. And that wrath is in the form of him losing his stable mind. First, we need to note under this heading, he was turned to function like an animal. You will be driven away from mankind and your dwelling place will be with the beasts of the field and you will be given grass to eat like cattle. He was turned to function like an animal. And secondly, he was driven away from mankind. Being driven away from mankind, being turned to function like an animal, he was turned to eat like a, a grazing animal. He was conditioned to live on the open land with the, the dew coming down on his back in the, in the early morning. According to one author, 
pagan writers of the ancient world tell us that after fighting his great wars and returning to Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar suddenly disappeared and emerged only a short while before his death. Those same writers tell us that one day he was seen on the roof of his palace from where he had a vantage point from which he could survey his whole city. That was the last that was seen of him for a very considerable time until just before his death. Other pagan writers say that he was seized by some form of divinity, while others comment that he was afflicted by a strange illness. Now, as good modernists and postmodernists do, we've come up with clinical names for things like this. There's some overarching names that could be used, but there's one specifically in the context called boanthropy. Boanthropy. This is a psychological disorder in which the sufferer believes he or she is a cow or ox. According to one psychological group, the most famous sufferer of this condition was King Nebuchadnezzar. It's interesting that they brought that up, isn't it? I remember seeing some years ago uh, a video somebody sent me, and it was a, a person in, in England. Um, they had decided they, they were a sheep. I'm, I'm trying to really not. The video is really odd and striking because the person had decided to live on all fours and graze with sheep. They still had an idea of, of their, their personhood uh, to, to a certain degree, but they completely had moved into this lifestyle. So much so that they were having problems with joints in their hands and knees and all kinds of things. So someone made this person some prosthetics so that they could live their life on all fours. It's really, it's odd to see a human being with these prosthetics hopping around with the sheep grazing on the grass. And we would, I mean, literally laugh. And, and I, I know it really shouldn't be funny, but it just grabs your mind. But I want you to think for a minute what is going on with a person that has lost the stability of mind to think that they now are a sheep or a cow. Now it tells you the society we live in today where then they looked at it as a strange illness. Now we're trying to find ways to make prosthetics to help people live like that. It's a weird society, isn't it? Well, here's the king of Babylon. I, I don't know who this gentleman was. He didn't seem to have any great background of note. I don't know that he had any history of note. But here's the very king of Babylon, uh, considered one of the greatest cities of the world, had one of the seven wonders of the world in the hanging gardens that he was over it being built. And now he's reduced to such instability of mind He's out grazing among the cows day and night, day and night. And we may laugh at this one instance. And there's multiple instances you can read about them. They're quite odd. But what a loss of the stability of mind. Do you recognize this was a prophecy given to Nebuchadnezzar and it is a prophecy fulfilled and it is the one living true God who prophesied it and fulfilled it. Even the stability of our minds is in the hands of the Lord.
Thirdly, Nebuchadnezzar lost his stable sovereignty. Nebuchadnezzar lost his stable sovereignty. Yes, God took the sovereignty of his kingdom away from him, but God took his personal sovereignty. He was once a mighty king, and then he was immediately a a crawling animal. His whole personal sovereignty was stripped away from him. He thought, I will move and have my being the way I want to. What did Paul say to that in Acts 17? He said, I will have my boundaries where I set them. What did Paul say to that in Acts 17? Not only was this a man that lost his stable kingdom and lost his stable mind, that he's out crawling around like an animal grazing in the grass, But this means he's lost his stable sovereignty, the very personal sovereignty where he thinks, by my free will, I'll do what I want. Do you think his free will would have designed and desired for him to be reduced to basically a man living like a beast or a cow grazing in an open pasture? In losing his stable sovereignty, number two under this third point, he recognized God's will is superior. God's will is superior. Nebuchadnezzar had a mind to survey the prophecy that was given to him in denial. Yet God willed that he would survey the prophecy with immediate revelation. He heard the prophecy. He turned around from it. And over a period of time, he kind of put it on the back burner. And now God says, okay, you don't want to bow. You don't want to bend the knee. You don't want to deal with me properly. You've only shown who you are and the need for this prophecy. And now it will be fulfilled in immediate revelation. He went from a man with a stable kingdom, a stable mind, and stable sovereignty, and it was gone. Just like that. He recognized God's will is superior. He had a mind to survey his kingdom from a palace, but God willed that he would survey it grazing like an animal. It's kind of a different view, isn't it? He went from a man who could stand on top of the palace and view all that he thought he had made and done to a man now that's out among the animals looking and staring at the ground for the next piece of grass that he will eat. Nebuchadnezzar had a mind to survey his kingdom in the comfort of his palace. God willed that he would survey it with the dew and sun on his back day and night. God's will is superior. Well, it leads us to three observations this morning. Number one, God is sovereign over everything, no matter the expanse or expense. God is sovereign over everything, no matter the expanse or expense. Who owns the cattle on a thousand hills? Read the psalmist talking about the grandeur of God's sovereignty and his majesty over the expanse of the creation. And that there's nothing in expense that is beyond God. We often think about the rich people of the world, the the Buffets, the Bill Gates, the Jeff Bezos. His wife now, or former wife, she's now the richest woman in the world. I don't recall her name, ladies, forgive me. That was not a 
desire to lessen you ladies. You can be billionaires too. But we think about them. Like they can just have anything they want. Nebuchadnezzar thought he could have anything he wants. But apart from Christ, what will Bill Gates and Buffett and, and, and Bezos and whoever else, what will they have? What will Elon Musk have? What will they have when Christ returns? They may think they have great expanse that they can buy anything they pretty much want to because they are the elite of the elite. They can spend $43 billion on something that amounts to a much of nothing. But their sovereignty is nothing compared to the God of all creation. He is sovereign over everything, no matter the expanse or the expanse. Have you ever, I mean, I know this is a little bit trivial, but have you ever thought about the fact that God has no financial concerns? It's a good reason to take ours to him. The one who owns the cattle on a thousand hills that created all things, he will provide what we need. If he knows even the bird, the birds of the air who need something to eat and he provides for them, will he not much more provide for us? It doesn't mean we'll be Gates and Bezos and all of that, but he'll provide our needs. He will take care of his people. Second observation. God is sovereign over everyone. He's sovereign over everything. God is sovereign over everyone, no matter the status or stature of a person. God is sovereign over everyone, no matter the status or stature of a person. Think for a moment of the stature of Nebuchadnezzar. And he is literally, literally brought to his knees by the very will and power of God. This is an example to us of the sovereignty of God over every person. It is an example to us of the sovereignty of God over every person regardless of status or stature. There is not one national or international world leader who is outside of the sovereignty of God. Not one of them. Not the worst warlord on a third world country or continent. Not the highest of dictators or the supposed most presidential of persons is outside of the sovereignty of God. You may have read some things about this murder trial, the Murdoch murders in South Carolina. You may have read some of the testimony of Mr. Murdoch and it reads like a man who thinks he's got everything under control. God is sovereign over everyone. Mr. Murdoch had a family line of the greatest stature of South Carolina and for years could have done pretty much anything he wanted and it looked like he got away with a lot of it and even some of his family members included. The old southern saying, the chickens came home to roost. The sovereignty of God appeared in a mighty way and brought justice.
Thirdly, I admit that this one doesn't quite go with the context of these other sentences. And I couldn't find any other way to say this, but I just wanted it to be plain. It doesn't go with this other structure, but I think I just wanted this to be plain. Number three, God lays people low not only in judgment, but in regenerate awakening. God lays people low not only in judgment, but in regenerate awakening. One writer says, Nebuchadnezzar certainly had an encounter with the living God, and his praise seemed sincere. Was this experience equivalent to a salvation, or did it fall short of saving faith? Well, let's look at his words in verse 34. But at the end of the period, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes toward heaven, and my reason returned to me, and I blessed the Most High and praised and honored him who lives forever. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom endures from generation to generation. It's the recognition of this sovereignty. All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing. But he does, that's about his will, he does according to his will in the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And no one can ward off his hand or say to him, what have you done? Now this, this in a way rings with Paul's words in Acts 17. It also rings with the end of Romans 8 and Romans 9. Who are you, O oh man, to talk back to God and say to him, why did you create me this way? This writer goes on and he says, after he asked the question, was this the equivalent of salvation or did it fall short of saving faith? He says, would young luck Rush Dooney and Wolverd believed that the king had a genuine salvation experience. But others, including Calvin, Kyle, or Kiel, if you say, and Archer, think that the king's faith fell short. He says, one cannot be dogmatic, but the language of the text suggests that Nebuchadnezzar did, in fact, have a saving encounter with the true God. As I read through these things over multiple weeks, and I've gone back over it in the years past, I can count at least three others that deny his conversion and two others that accept it. As a matter of fact, Stuart Aliot, a Reformed Baptist pastor in, uh, in England, he now lives on mainland Europe, he just point blank says that Nebuchadnezzar died a godly, blessed man, something to that effect. Edward J. Young, which was mentioned previously, probably gave the most discernible outline as far as, a work, as worked out reasons for accepting that Nebuchadnezzar had a salvation experience. Quote, he says, The matter is difficult to determine and perhaps cannot be determined. Nevertheless, there are certain considerations which would lead to the conclusion that the king did, after all, experience in his heart the regenerating grace of God. Number one, he says, There is discernible progress or a discernible progress in his knowledge of God. Chapter 2 verse 47 with chapter 3 verse 28 and finally what we see here in chapter 4. Number 2 he says the king acknowledges the utter sovereignty of God with respect to his own experience. This goes along with what I was saying about Paul's words in Acts 17 and Romans 8 and 9. There seems to be some idea of these truths in his response. And number three, Young points out, the king utters true statements concerning the omnipotence of the true God, verse 34 and 35. And then he says, number four, the king would worship this God whom he identifies as king of heaven. Verse 37, 
Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise, exalt, and honor the King of heaven, for all his works are true and his ways just, and he is able to humble those who walk in pride. This sounds very similar to the words of Job at the end of Job, don't they? Young goes on and says, These reasons lead me to believe that although the faith of Nebuchadnezzar may indeed have been weak and his knowledge meager, yet his faith was saving faith and his knowledge true. Now there may be some this morning that have looked at this in the past and you've come to different conclusions. And you, you may not agree with the idea that there was some regenerate work done here. And you say, well, I'm not sure your observation fits with Nebuchadnezzar. Well, that's fine. You may not think it fits with Nebuchadnezzar, and that's okay. It really is because it fits with other places in Scripture. Think of Saul of Tarsus. Did not God not bring him low? To regenerate him? He went from the highest point of his own pride, thinking he had it all, and he was going to be the arbiter of truth, and he was going to persecute and be a part of persecution and putting people to death. And who was it that had a greater will than Paul or Saul of Tarsus? The Lord God did. And he brought him low, even in a regenerate work. I think we can say that genuine faith is immediate. I think we can say that from this text. Ooh, I haven't done that in a long time. I think we can say from this text and others that genuine faith is immediate, but the road to it may be long, winding, and filled with difficulties. So some individuals seem especially hardened sinners, but God is capable of regenerating any dead soul according to his will. Are you concerned about a friend or a family member? How hardened they may be. Someone you work with or someone you know is just an acquaintance. The Lord, the God of heaven and earth, is sovereign over absolutely everything. And according to his will, he is more than capable of bringing any dead soul to life in Christ Jesus. You may not even be able to be around certain people because of how they act and what they do. You may have even had to separate yourself from certain individuals. And you did so rightly with good caution and reasonable understanding. But you can still pray to the God of heaven that he changes that person and brings them from death to life in Christ Jesus. And according to his will, he will do whatever pleases him, and whatever he does is good and right. And we will leave it in his hands. Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you've been merciful to give us your word that we may glory in you. Even as we come to this table, may we May we remember to glory in you through the person and work of your son Christ as we fellowship and the sharing of his sufferings as we gather around the bread and the cup. We ask that your spirit deal with our souls according to the truth of your word. We may have forgotten your sovereignty we may have looked 
and taken little stock of our own sin. Deal with our souls according to the truth of your word that we may grow in the grace of your son Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen.